All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 As sojourners and exiles on the earth, Christians must prepare to suffer ridicule for our faith. This week on All of Life for God, Pastor Jacob Tanner considers Paul's exhortation to Timothy in the face of a hostile opposition. To hear more from Pastor Tanner and the Puritans, check out his new book, Wait and Hope, Puritan Wisdom for Joyful Suffering, at the link in our show notes. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and open them, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking this morning from verse 10 down to verse number 17, and we are continuing in our series for the month of July on earthly suffering and future hope. Earthly suffering and future hope. We're taking a short break from the gospel according to Matthew to work through some passages relating to the suffering that we experience and that we go through as Christians, but also to acknowledge the fact that there is indeed hope. Hope for the Christian that one day God is going to wipe away every tear. God is going to right every single wrong, and he is going to swallow up all this suffering with an eternal weight of glory. So what we want to do this morning is we want to focus particularly on the suffering that others inflict upon us. And so although this is part two of earthly suffering and future hope, you can kind of give the subtitle to this sermon, When Others Cause Our Suffering. When Others Cause Our Suffering. And we're going to be looking at a multitude of different ways that others can cause suffering, but primarily at the persecution that we often experience as followers of Christ. So if you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, And if you're able, please stand with me for the reverence of the reading of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse number 10, the word of the Lord reads, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Thus sends this reading of the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God. Receive it as such. And let's go to the Lord once more in prayer together. Father, as we come before you again, we thank you and we praise you for your word, for the truth of your word, and for the encouragement that your word gives to us. For Lord, we who are your people, we who are your followers, do indeed experience persecution of all different sorts, from all different places. And yet you encourage us within your word that to be persecuted as a follower of Christ is a sign that we have striven to live godly lives. It is a sign in a way that we are exactly where you would have us to be. So Lord, we pray that you would grant us boldness, that you would grant us strength and encouragement to continue to stand firm and steadfast in spite of the persecution that is hurled our way. And Lord, if there is one here today or one listening who does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would use your word, that you would use this sermon, the preaching of your word, to lead them to Christ, to draw them irresistibly to Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation, that counting the cost, they would recognize Jesus is worth all else. And so, Lord, we pray that you would hide me behind your cross, make these words yours, not mine, and receive glory, honor, and praise, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we look at this text and as we 
consider what Paul is saying, how all who, live, who, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. I can't help but think in my own head, going back through the centuries over countless saints, countless heroes of mine who have followed Christ and who have had to endure great persecution primarily because they were followers of Christ. One of my favorite examples of this is, of course, John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a man who was no scholar. In fact, in his early childhood, he had no education at all, really, to speak of. And he says that by the time he grew older, he forgot everything that he had learned, even going so far as to say that he had basically forgotten how to read and how to write. He never went to college. He never went to seminary. And as a young man, he actually lived a rather profane, vulgar, sinful life. Now, in his own words, he talks about things like how he would go out and he would participate in dancing and he would play games like a game almost like baseball and he would play card games. And you hear some of that and you go, well, is that really all that wicked and all that sinful? I mean, Compared to the stuff that goes on today, comparatively speaking, it seems like he wasn't that bad. But then you read some of, other, of some of the other things that Bunyan was doing, and he says his favorite pastime was to take the Lord's name in vain. And he particularly loved to do it on the Lord's day. He was a foul, vulgar man. He swore a great deal. And one of my favorite stories from his life comes when he's going through the town one day, playing the madman, he's swearing, he's cursing, and a woman stops him, a woman who was known to be profane herself. Nobody thought she was godly. They all said she was a sinner. And she stops Bunyan and she says to him, if you keep swearing like that, you're going to corrupt all of the youth in this town. And Bunyan was so taken aback because he was being rebuked by one of the most sinful women that he was aware of that the Lord began this process of drawing him to repentance and faith in Christ. One day, he overheard women discussing their own conversion to Christ, and he realized he wanted what they had. And eventually, over the course of a great deal of time, the Lord drew Bunyan to Christ and he was saved and he was converted and he was regenerated and his sins were washed away and he was made holy and righteous. But do you think the people rejoiced that Bunyan was now saved? Not quite. They would continue to mock him and taunt him. See, not only was he uneducated, but he came from a rather poor background. He was a tinker. This was basically somebody who went around the countryside repairing pots and pans. It wasn't really a great way to make a living. And they would call him the poor, uneducated tinker. And when he began to preach, it got worse because people loved to hear Bunyan preach. And crowds would come to hear him despite not having an education, despite not having gone to seminary, despite basically being self-taught. Men like John Owen, one of my favorite Puritans, who actually did go to seminary, who actually taught at the seminary level, he would go and he would listen to Bunyan, one of his great friends, and he would say, if only I could preach like him. But people hated Bunyan for it. And the taunts got even worse, and they began to say that perhaps he was still unconverted. And you would think that the persecution was only coming from those outside the church, but that wasn't the case at all. His own brothers and sisters in Christ would taunt him. They would persecute him. Even after he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, which proved to be immensely popular, he was thrown into prison. In fact, he wrote that book while he was in prison. And while he was in prison for preaching the gospel without a license from the Church of England, his enemies would continue to mock him. They would continue to write these tracts and these books and these letters against Bunyan and his teaching. And rather than help the man who was going to spend a relatively large portion of his relatively short life in prison, they continued to mock him and they basically rejoiced that this man had been thrown into prison. And yet through it all, through the loss of a wife, through the birth of a blind daughter, through many trials and sufferings, Bunyan kept his joy. Bunyan continued to serve Christ, despite the lies, the slanderous accusations that he had to bear and contend with and deal with, he kept the faith 
and he kept the course. And I believe one of the primary reasons why is because he understood what Paul was saying here in this passage. Suffering is typical for the Christian. And persecution is, in a sense, normative. Now, we may never experience the persecution and suffering Bunyan did. Maybe we'll never go to prison. Maybe we'll never go to jail for our faith. Maybe we'll never experience what Martin Luther did when he had to go into hiding because they had labeled him a heretic and they actually wanted to kill him. Maybe we'll never experience the persecution of a John Calvin who till this very day continues to be slandered and people say that he was a demonic false prophet and that he was a murderer and all of these other terrible lies are told about him. Maybe we'll never have to deal with things specifically like that. But I'm sure if we went around this morning, the honest consensus would be each of us, to some extent or another, in one form or another, must contend with not just suffering, but suffering at the hands of others, persecution. And so what Paul does in this passage is he's writing to his protege in the faith, Timothy, and he's saying to him, look at me, look at my life, see how I have been persecuted, expect the same. And then he gets specific and he says, in fact, if you're going to be a Christ follower, it's going to get worse. But then he gives us some methods. He gives us some ways that not only can we endure the suffering and the persecution, but we can do so patiently, hopefully, and joyfully. So we're going to take this step by step and beginning in verses 10 and 11, this is what we see. Number one, To follow Jesus, we must be aware of the persecutions we will have to endure. To follow Jesus, we must be aware of the persecutions we will have to endure. Now again, verse 12, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. And we're going to see that Those who are committed to Christ, those who are most committed to the truth, are going to be those who experience the greatest amount of persecution. And it is not at all a sign that God has abandoned us. It is not at all a sign that God hates us or has turned on us. It is instead a sign that our good shepherd is walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death. It is a sign that we are exactly where God intends for us to be. So verses 10 to 11, we read, you, and he's writing to Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. In other words, Timothy, you know my character. You know what I'm like. You know how I live. You know how I behave. But you also know my persecutions my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet, from them all, the Lord rescued me. We will be right back. You're listening to the All of Life for God podcast from Reformation Heritage Books. Use the code ALG at checkout to save 10% on your next order. Want to start reading the Puritans but don't know where to begin? Puritan Treasures for Today from Reformation Heritage Books makes the riches of these godly writers of old accessible for the modern reader. With updated language and helpful introductions, These classic works from John Owen, Jeremiah Burroughs, and others are the perfect starting point for the curious reader. Learn more about Puritan treasures for today at heritagebooks.org forward slash Puritan treasures. What is the Christian parent's greatest responsibility? to teach their children to trust the one true living God. Enrich your family devotions from the Family Worship Bible Guide. This precious book 
offers rich devotional thoughts for children of all ages on every chapter in the Bible. To learn more about the Family Worship Bible Guide, visit heritagebooks.org. Would you like to deepen your understanding of Reformed theology? Check out Reformed Systematic Theology, Volume 4, Church and Last Things by Dr. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley. This book will lead you to explore key scripture topics from biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical perspectives. Order the culmination of Dr. Beakey's life's work at heritagebooks.org slash RST4. Thanks for listening to the All of Life for God podcast. Don't forget to enter the code ALG to save 10% on your next order with Reformation Heritage Books. What wonderful news it is to know that the reason we can endure these trials is because it is the Lord himself who rescues us. It is the Lord himself who is our strength. It is the Lord himself who is our deliverer. So we can look to him in hope. But we also have to acknowledge that to follow Jesus is basically to put a, put a big target on your back. So that to follow Jesus is to immediately place yourself within a cosmic war. It's a war that Jesus Christ has already won, but it is a war all the same. And there are many battles to be fought in the Christian life. The reformers recognize that there are three enemies that every Christian must battle. The world, the flesh, our own flesh, and the devil. And the truth is, we really don't even need the devil or the world to come against us because we're often our own worst enemies. Our flesh will cause all manner of temptation to rise up within us and to contend against us. Often we battle things like anxiety, fear, anger, lusts, jealousy, you name it. And we can be our own worst critics as well. We're really good at beating ourselves into the ground. But then it doesn't stop there. It's not just us, our flesh that we're fighting against. It's also the world. Those outside of the church, the enemies of God become our enemies. And then we also have Satan as well, that old dragon who himself is aiming his fiery darts against us. And so with all of these different enemies, we need to be aware of the fact we're in a battle. We're in a war. There's a war that we're fighting. It's been won by Christ, but it's a war all the same. And we need to understand that the persecution will come. It will come. It's not a matter of, is it going to come? If it comes, it's a matter of when. And what are you gonna do when it does come? And that's why Paul's writing to Timothy, basically. Timothy, be a good soldier of Christ. Be a good soldier of the cross. Look to me. You see my patience. You see my joy. You see my long suffering. You see my manner of conduct. You know that my greatest desire is to see sinners saved and brought to the knowledge of Christ. You know that this is what I want more than anything else. And yet, I suffer. And yet, I'm persecuted. And Timothy, you're going to experience much the same. But stand steadfast, keep the faith, keep the hope. One of the greatest forms of persecution I think that we experience as Christians, and it's part of what Paul is contending with here, and it's also part of what we know Timothy had to contend with as well, is lies that are told about us. Slanderous accusations that are made against us. I mean, when you consider throughout church history, the different things people had to, con- had to contend with. Things like Bunyan, dealing with the slander that he was just an unlearned, unconverted tinker. And they refused to acknowledge that he was a Christian, that he was gifted by the Holy Spirit to preach the word of God. You think of men like Paul, who were slandered constantly. Or how about Jesus himself? 
They had absolutely nothing that they could use to pin on him as a crime to crucify him. And so they said of Jesus, they had to get people to come in, lie about him, slander him. And they said, well, this Jesus, he said that he would destroy the temple and in three days he would build it again. And they knew they were lying. They knew that that's not what Jesus meant. They knew that he had been talking about himself, his own body, which he proved, by the way, after his death when he rose from the dead three days later. But they bring this charge of blasphemy against him, and they use it to nail him to the cross. Paul, actually, it's interesting. It's almost the same thing happens to Paul. They don't really have any charge to bring against him. So the Jews say of Paul in the book of Acts that he was preaching against the law of God and that he had brought an unconverted heathen Gentile into the temple, thus defiling it. So again, they bring a charge of blasphemy and defilement against Paul, and that's how they arrest him and put him into a jail cell and bring him all the way to Rome. But this isn't peculiar to the New Testament age. This happened in the Old Testament too. David was persecuted by many, especially during the time of King Saul, where they would bring charges to Saul against David saying, he wants your throne. He wants to attack you. He wants to take your throne crown for himself. Moses dealt with the same, even from his own family, when they said that he was not fit, he was not called to be the one to lead them through the wilderness all the way to the promised land. Those are all biblical examples. I can give you examples from my own life of slanderous accusations that I have had to endure. And Honestly, I could fill up the whole length of time just sharing those accusations with you this morning, but I'll just give you one of my favorite because I think it's really funny. Since we have started Christ Keystone Church, since we planted this church in this area, the one slander that I have received more than any other is the slander that our church is a cult. And specifically, the reason people say this is because I wear my theology on my sleeve. There's no question about what Jacob Tanner believes. People know I'm a Calvinist. People know that I hold, when it comes to eschatology, to postmillennialism. And people hear these things and they go, he's a cult leader. Or my favorite, actually, related to that, is that because Calvinism, they say, is a doctrine of demons, that I teach a demonic doctrine slanderous accusations. In fact, one of my favorite was the one-star review we got that just simply said, Colt. That one made me laugh for quite a while, and I wish it was still there. But anyway, these slanderous accusations that are hurled against us, these persecutions that we must endure, in one way, we have to laugh at them. And the reason we have to laugh at them is because it totally disarms our enemies. Remember, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can laugh when these slanderous accusations are made, when the persecutions come, because we know the Lord of glory. But at the same time, you need to count the cost. You need to know that to follow Jesus is going to mean people are going to hate you because they hated your Lord. Obviously, they're going to hate you. This is why Jesus says, count the cost, know the cost of following me. But then recognize the cost is worth it. Because as Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. See, when you come to faith in Christ, trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection, not only are you eternally saved, but you are promised, you are guaranteed your enemies can't permanently defeat you. They can battle you. They can make you endure a great deal of hardship and trial. But the Lord will right every wrong. Vengeance is his. It's why the psalmist says in Psalm 118, verses six and seven, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. That is our great hope. The worst they can do is kill our body. They can't kill body and soul. God has promised us eternal life. We will live forever and these bodies of ours will be resurrected come what may. So we can have a triumphant hope. 
But we have to be aware of the fact that not only is the persecution going to come, but it's going to come from a very particular place. And so we see in verses 12 through 13, number two, the godly must particularly expect persecution from the ungodly. The godly must particularly expect persecution from the ungodly. In other words, those who are outside of the church, those who are unconverted, those who are not Christians, are not going to be our best friends. Can you have friends outside the church? Of course, I'm not saying that. Can you have friends who are not Christians? Of course, I'm not saying that you can. But should you expect from them the same things you expect from your brothers and sisters in Christ? The same sort of love, the same sort of compassion, the same sort of fellowship? No. And it would be foolish to expect it because this is what we're told in verses 12 to 13. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And this is one of those instances in scripture where all really does mean all. All who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I've joked for a while that when I was younger, verse 12 really kind of concerned me because I started preaching when I was 16. That's almost 14 years ago now, and there wasn't much persecution at the time. I mean, I would go out and I would preach, and if I'm being honest, this isn't right, but I would try to make people upset with the things I would say. I would try to do your hellfire and brimstone sermons just to see if I could get a rise out of people. And it's like they would sit there with smiles on their faces, and they would just be happy. It was like, hey, the cute 16-year-old is here thinking that he can preach the word of God. It's like no matter what I did, I didn't seem to experience persecution. And this worried me, and I wondered, what am I doing wrong? Well, it was really dumb of me to worry about that at all because it didn't take long for the persecution to come and to come in some ways that I never imagined it would come. In fact, as I look at back over the past few years, the persecution that I have had to endure and the persecution that our church has had to endure from others has been not just like waves that ebb and flow, like they go out for a little bit and then they come against you, but then you get a period of peace. No, it's been like a tsunami. And that tsunami just keeps on hurling wave and wave and wave after wave at me and us. And every single time that it seems like, well, maybe the, the waves are going to reside for a little bit and we can get our heads up and get a breath of fresh air. You look up and there comes another tsunami wave about to crush you again against the rocks. But here's the good news. As Charles Spurgeon once said, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. I've learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. I don't want the persecution. None of us do. We don't want the suffering. We don't long for these things. We don't pray for these things. But as we endure these things, we find out that God is using them for our good to build us up in the body of Christ, to build us up as Christians. In fact, two primary reasons God permits the suffering and the persecution to come is to first of all, teach us to pursue Christ and godliness despite the challenges and difficulties. And then secondly, to cling to Christ, our anchor of the soul, our hope who keeps us steadfast and sure while the sea billows roll. Jesus is this anchor. He's the rock of ages. And as the persecution comes, it pushes us closer and closer up against Christ. But why does the persecution come? It's because the godless hate the godly. And I think one of the primary reasons for this is jealousy. They're jealous of what they see we have. We have joy in Christ. We have peace in Christ. We have righteousness in Christ. We have security in Christ and so on and so forth. And they see these things and they want these things, but they don't understand these things and they don't want Christ. And so in their jealousy, they act out in anger 
and in hatred, and they persecute us. I really like the way, actually, that John Calvin put this in his commentary on this text. He said, Paul exhorts all the children of God to prepare for enduring persecutions. For if this condition is laid down, all who wish to live a godly life in Christ, they who wish to be exempt from persecutions must necessarily renounce Christ. In vain shall we endeavor to detach Christ from his cross. For it may be said to be natural that the world should hate Christ even in his members. Now hatred is attended by cruelty and hence arise persecutions. In short, let us know that we are Christians on this condition, that we shall be liable to many tribulations and various contests. So in other words, we need to understand if you're going to be a Christian, one of the signs, one of the marks of your Christianity is the enduring of persecution. If you're somebody who never experiences any of this in any form whatsoever, then I would be worried. Because it's a universal principle that if you're living for Christ, somehow, some way, to various degrees, there will be persecution. In fact, this is really one of the main themes of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Going back to earlier in the chapter, verses 1 through 9, what Paul is explaining is that there are false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing, who constantly come against us. He says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will be times of difficulty. And by the way, we've been in the last days since the advent of Jesus Christ. So there's been times of difficulty for the last 2,000 years. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men." So who were Janus and Jambres or Jambres? We don't really know. What we think, what we believe is that probably they were magicians in Pharaoh's court who opposed Moses and Aaron. But the point of this text is that even those enemies could not stand long against God and his people. God, who always proves victorious, makes us victorious in Christ. It's the same thing Paul writes later in chapter 4, verses 14 to 18. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, but the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So beloved, we may have to endure the persecution of Janus and Jambres within our own lives. There might be Alexander the coppersmiths who come against us, who hate the message that we try to proclaim, who hate us. But remember, The Lord's on our side. The Lord will shut the mouths of the lions, just as he did for Daniel in the lion's den. Yes, Satan may be a prowling lion seeking whom he may devour, but our Lord, our strong tower, our defender, our strength, he shuts that lion's mouth and keeps him from devouring us. So we can have hope. But if we're gonna have hope in the face of persecutions like these, what must we do? Well, Paul gives us two things that we must do to continue in hope. And so we see thirdly, in verses 14 and 15, to endure persecution, we must continue to look to Christ. 
to endure persecution, we must continue to look to Christ. Now, this is what we saw last week, too, that to endure suffering in a general way, we look to Christ as our great treasure, and it still holds true today. To endure persecution, cling to Christ while knowing that he clings even more tightly to you. Verses 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and what you have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Where did Timothy learn it from? Well, he learned it from his Christian mother and grandmother, and he learned it from the Apostle Paul. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, that is, the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We will be right back. You're listening to the All of Life for God podcast from Reformation Heritage Books. Use the code ALG at checkout to save 10% on your next order. Live as if you thought that Christ might come at any time. 19th century evangelical leader J.C. Ryle knew that there was only one way to prepare for Christ's return to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives. Now you can take up this charge daily with Our Great Redeemer, a new 365-day devotional featuring excerpts from J.C. Ryle's sermons. This compilation of 365 powerful readings from Ryle's preaching and writing is rich with the grace, truth, and conviction that define Ryle's ministry. Pre-order Our Great Redeemer at the link in our show notes to receive the ebook today, along with an exclusive J.C. Ryle bookmark. Thanks for listening to the All of Life for God podcast. Don't forget to enter the code ALG to save 10% on your next order with Reformation Heritage Books. In Christ, our hope is found. And there is no else to whom we can turn. It's why 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our treasure, our eternal treasure, worth the loss of all else. But Jesus is not merely our treasure. In a sense, this knowledge of Jesus is also our weapon in which we wage war against these spiritual forces. Jesus is also our grand defense that protects us from all of this wickedness and all of this evil. Jesus, the great dragon crusher who was foretold in Genesis 3.15, who would crush Satan's head beneath his feet, is the same Jesus who now promises us victory over our greatest enemies. As Romans 16, 20 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This dragon crusher will crush the dragon beneath our feet too. And he will rule and he will footstool all his enemies beneath his feet and he will do much the same for us. That's why Habakkuk 3, 13 says, God went out for the salvation of his people for the salvation of his anointed. God crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. If you want to endure persecution, slanderous accusations, lies, all of these different things, the hatred and animosity of others, look to Christ because he alone is your hope. But if you're gonna look to Christ, you need to know who Christ is. And how do you find out who Christ is? Through his word. And so the second thing we must do to endure persecution with joy and patience and long-suffering steadfastness is be in the word. And so we see fourthly in verses 16 and 17, to endure suffering, we must be made complete by the word of God. To endure suffering, we must be made complete by the word of God. Verses 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I think that often we look at verses 16 and 17 as though they're detached from all of the other verses. And we treat them as though they are only proofs that the word of God is in fact inspired by God. And that's not necessarily wrong. We can use this text to explain the word of God is 
the word of God. Although God used human agents, by the Holy Spirit, he breathed these words out. Although those human agents and authors did not lose their personalities, yet this is genuinely and truly the word of God. And yes, it's profitable for all these things. It rebukes us in our sin. It reproves and corrects us and makes us holy and righteous in Christ by telling us how we ought to live in Christ Jesus. It completes us. It furnishes us. It equips us to live for Jesus. But within the overall context of 2 Timothy 3, One of the things Paul wants us desperately to see is that the word of God equips us and completes us to endure persecution with joy and hope and steadfast gladness. Now, I know you might be sitting here this morning and you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's all well and good, but my persecution, it's not like that. I'm not being thrown into prison like Paul was. People aren't despising me for my youth like they did Timothy. I'm not like Bunyan. I'm not being thrown into prison for most of my life. I'm not like Calvin. People aren't calling me a murderer. I'm not like Luther. I don't have to go on the run from those who want to kill me. Your persecution may be very different. Maybe you've lost family, friends, loved ones. Maybe you've lost jobs or job offers or job advancements because of your faith in Christ. Maybe people have just said a couple of mean things about you behind your back. Or maybe it's been even worse, and you're just like, I don't know how I'm going to endure this any longer. And so you're wondering, does this really speak to me? And the answer is yeah, absolutely. Whether the persecution seems incredibly big, bigger than you could possibly imagine, or it seems like, well, compared to others, kind of small, Whatever the case may be, the word of God will speak to you. It will teach you how to walk through the persecution, how to endure it, and to endure it triumphantly. Turning again to Calvin, he explains, It is not always in one way that Satan persecutes the servants of Christ, but yet it is absolutely unavoidable that all of them shall have the world for their enemy and some form or other that their faith may be tried and their steadfastness proved. For Satan, who is the continual enemy of Christ, will never suffer any one to be at peace during his whole life. And there will always be wicked men that are thorns in our sides. Moreover, as soon as zeal for God is manifested by a believer, it kindles the rage of all ungodly men. And although they have not drawn a sword, yet they vomit out their venom, either by murmuring or by slander, or by raising a disturbance, or by other methods. Accordingly, although all the saints are not exposed to the same assaults and do not engage in the same battles, yet all of us have a warfare in common and shall never be wholly at peace and exempt from persecutions. That is, we shall not be exempt until we reach that celestial city and stand in the presence of Jesus. And so until then, God has given us his word. His word equips us, his word completes us, his word teaches us. And it teaches us specifically theology. And here's why theology matters such a great deal, because you cannot hold faith, hope, and confidence in a God you don't know. Theology matters because you need to know God in order to love God. Theology matters because Jesus told us the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which means the mind must be engaged in living for Christ. And if you're going to endure persecution, hardship, slanderous accusations, lies, falsehoods, knives in the back, if you're going to handle animosity, the hatred of others, if you're going to handle these things with patience and joy and long-suffering steadfastness, then you need the word of God. Because only the word of God will point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's be in the scriptures. Let's live according to what thus saith the Lord And when the persecution, the hardship, and the trial comes, let's continue to remember to cling to Christ above all else. Stand with me as we pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, O Lord, that within your word, you have taught us that not only should we expect persecution, 
but you have taught us how to handle it. You have taught us how to receive it. And you have also taught us to understand the hope that we have in Christ, that we are victorious and triumphant in him over even the worst forms of persecution. So Lord, whatever we're going through, cause us to remain steadfast, cause us to stand firm and give us boldness, courage, and joy. And yes, even love for those who persecute us that we would desire earnestly to see their salvation as well. We thank you, praise you, and love you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to All of Life for God by Reformation Heritage Books. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. Reformation Heritage Books is a nonprofit ministry that aims to strengthen the church through Reformed, Puritan, and experiential literature. To learn more about this ministry and how to support us, please visit rhb.org.